Tomorrow marks six months since Hamas terrorists streamed into Israel, killing some 1,200 people and kidnapping more than 200. In response, Israel launched a war on Hamas, pounding the Gaza Strip starting in the north and moving to the south. According to Gaza Health Ministry, more than 33,000 Palestinians have been killed <clears throat> excuse me, since the war began. And during these past six months, the United States has stood lockstep with Israel. But we may be at a critical turning point in that relationship in the wake of the Israeli airstrikes that killed seven aid workers from renowned relief organization World Central Kitchen on April 1st. In a report released yesterday, the Israel Defense Force called the strike a grave mistake after its own investigation found that serious errors and violations of protocol led Israeli forces to, quote, mistakenly assume Hamas gunmen were inside the aid vehicles. NBC News has not independently verified that claim. Two high-ranking members of the Israeli military have been dismissed from their posts, and three others have been formally reprimanded. World Central Kitchen says this is an important step forward, but it's not enough. The humanitarian organization is demanding an immediate independent investigation, pointing out, quote, the IDF cannot credibly investigate its own failure. The tragedy appears to have sparked a come-to-Jesus meeting between Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and President Biden, who suggested a showdown was coming during a hot mic moment after his State of the Union address last month. The meeting came in the form of a tense phone call on Thursday, during which the president underscored the need for an immediate ceasefire. Biden called the deadly strike on the aid workers unacceptable and for the first time suggested that there could be a shift in U.S. policy unless Netanyahu enacts, quote, a series of specific, concrete and measurable steps to address the protection of civilians in Gaza. In response, Israel has committed to opening additional aid routes that will allow desperately needed aid into northern Gaza, including the Erez crossing, which has been closed since October 7th. And the aid can't come soon enough. The U.N. Secretary General is warning, quote, Gaza is on the brink of mass starvation. The increasing outcry over the humanitarian crisis in Gaza has also put a spotlight on U.S. military aid to Israel. The United States is by far the largest supplier of military aid, providing more than $130 billion since the nation's founding in 1948. And now a growing number of Democrats is calling for conditions on that aid. I think we're at the point where uh, President Biden has said, and I have said, and others have said, if Benjamin Netanyahu, prime minister, were to order the IDF into Rafah at scale, they were to drop 1,000-pound bombs and send in a battalion uh, to go after Hamas and make no provision for civilians uh, or for humanitarian aid, that, that I would vote to condition aid to Israel. I've never said that before. I've never been here before. When we talk about conditions, the bottom line condition has to be full accommodation for the delivery of humanitarian aid to the suffering people in Palestine. Yesterday, President Biden and Secretary of State Antony Blinken received a letter signed by more than three dozen House Democrats urging them to reconsider the decision to authorize an arms package transfer to Israel and to withhold future transfers until there's an investigation into the airstrike that killed those aid workers. My next guest signed that letter. Joining me now, Democratic Congresswoman Madeline Dean of Pennsylvania, member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Congresswoman Dean, as always, uh, thank you for coming to the Saturday show. What kind of conditions do you want placed on aid to Israel? Jonathan, it's good to be with you. And obviously this week, the grievous, uh, precise attack on three vehicles carrying the World Central Kitchen aid workers, killing seven of them. Uh, has provoked extraordinary outrage, anger, uh, disappointment uh, across the board. Uh, I'm sure it's true also in Israel. We have to start with one thing. The enemy here is Hamas. It was Hamas who attacked Israel on October the 7th. And while we lost these angels, as uh, Chef uh, Jose Andres says, 
Uh, do you know that we've lost more than 200 other aid workers in Gaza in the last six months? I was there in Israel twice now during the, this conflict, first on November the 11th and then again in February. We met with UNRWA. At that time, they had lost 147 aid workers. And the, the chief of UNRWA, the director sitting in Rafa, an American military uh, hero, uh, said, uh, we have lost more than 147 workers, and yet every day the remaining ones come and work. What do we have to do in terms of conditioning aid? I signed the letter that was uh, uh, drafted by Mr. Pocan, uh, Ms. Schakowsky, and um, Mr. McGovern. Uh, I'm proud to have signed on to it to say we have to take a look at what aid, what military munitions are going to Israel. After all, the use of 2,000-pound dumb bombs in Gaza, so imprecise, with the ability to take out whole buildings, is unacceptable. 33,000 people are dead. It is estimated that one half of those are children. And Israel has not told us the number in that that is actually Hamas. So we've got a tremendous number of civilians dead. We have the responsibility and the right, frankly, uh, as Congress, as this administration, um, under the Memorandum of, of uh, Security, number 20, uh, dated February the 8th, we have the responsibility of oversight and conditioning aid where military use is not uh, Discriminate, Congresswoman. I've been calling the deadly that the deadly airstrike on World Central Kitchen a turning point in the U.S.-Israel relationship and in the relationship between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu. Am I overstating things here? I'm not sure. Uh, I have to tell you, I'm very proud of the president. I spoke with the White House the morning of the phone call with Mr. Netanyahu this week, uh, and certainly we have heard from the readout uh, that this was a very tough phone call. Uh, and what I agree with the president on is that it's unacceptable, the number of deaths uh, and the deaths of innocent civilians, not to mention humanitarian workers, angels. Uh, mm -hmm. what, Mr., uh, what Mr. Biden told Mr. Netanyahu was, number one, now a temporary ceasefire to get the hostages out. I called for a bilateral ceasefire February the 28th uh, in order to get the hostages out and humanitarian aid in. Number two, what we know the president said, and I'm very proud of him for doing this, is to Mr. Netanyahu, Mr. Netanyahu, enable your negotiators, your hostage negotiators, to get the hostages out immediately. It baffles me. You noted that tomorrow will mark six months since this horrendous, grievous, grotesque attack. And I saw evidence of it as I visited Israel. But how is it that Mr. Netanyahu has not been focused singularly on the release of the hostages. Congresswoman, last question for you on this. Speaking of the prime minister, a member of his war cabinet, Benny Gantz, has called for early elections for September. Is a change in leadership in Israel what is needed to, to bring an end to this war? I'm very mindful that I'm a member of one government. It is not on me to tell Israeli citizens what to do. But I see in the streets the pictures you are showing right now. Mm -hmm. Mr. Netanyahu's prosecution of this war, we can all observe, uh, has been indiscriminate and has not been clear. And I am very critical of the prosecution of this war. Uh, so Mr. Gans and, and Israeli citizens themselves, and importantly, Palestinians, need to have elections. We need ultimately, Jonathan, I know you know this, and Mr. Netanyahu's not interested in it, a two-state solution. The region cries for a two-state solution for dignity and sovereignty for two peoples. Uh, that's what has to happen. Mm -hmm. And I bet that has to happen by way of elections, both in Israel and in Gaza and in Palestine. Let's not forget the West Bank. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.